about things because everything kind of connects to each other. Um, and then this is specifically what I do. A lot of CTA roles are slightly different depending on just like what the company wants, what the company needs, uh, that kind of thing. So first responsibility is my TMF responsibilities. Some as other companies, they have TMF departments um, that handle all of that for you. But uh, specifically with mine, I QC the documents, I classify and file those documents in the TMF. And then I also perform biannual completeness reviews um, on the studies that I, I help manage. Um, another portion of my responsibilities is the meeting and scheduling. So I'm in charge of managing the large study meeting. So that includes the SMT meetings, meetings that we have with our vendors or our CROs or the ops team in general. Um, and then also uh, our quarterly safety meetings, which we um, are required to have based off of our company's SOP. Um, and so this includes basically scheduling, rescheduling if like essential people that need to be there aren't available at those times. And then also canceling if those meetings aren't really needed uh, that week or that, uh, that month. Um, also updating distribution lists. So as people leave the company or people come into the company or, um, you're adding different people from like the vendors or the CROs, uh, just making sure that those invite lists are up to date. Um, also helping prepare slides. So for the vendors and the CRO, um, I don't really prepare a lot of slides. Mostly that's the responsibility of the vendor and CRO to kind of give us an update as the ops team. Uh, but for like the SMT or the ops meetings, I help prepare slides to basically um, present where, where our study is in the moment to, um, to different departments, whether that be like data management or regulatory, stuff like that. Um, and then also lastly, just to distributing the agendas and minutes. So agendas before the meeting happens so people know what's going on and then minutes after the fact. So if people weren't there or they need a recap of what happened, they can read that. Um, also part of uh, meetings and scheduling is facilitating scheduling uh, schedules with the sites. So, in a clinical trial, you're going to have sites and those are going to be external people. Those are usually going to be like hospitals, research centers, uh, private practice offices. Um, it all kind of depends. Um, and basically scheduling PSVs, SIVs, and COVs with them. That is pre-study visits, site initiation visits, and then closeout visits. Usually this involves um, blocking off our medical monitor, so that's on the sponsor side, schedule because they're really, really busy and trying to communicate with one of the study coordinators to try and make sure that the PI and hopefully some of the sub eyes can make it to that PSV or SIV or COV visit. Um, some of these are in person. A lot of them can be remote as well. Um, portions of these, usually there's a CRA on site for these. Um, but it also, it kind of just depends on um, the study and how the company works. Um, so I kind of broke it down into the different portions of uh, the sites uh, for responsibilities. So when I'm looking at site startup activities, um, I'm responsible for collecting all these regulatory documents. These have to basically be submitted from regulatory to the FDA to basically say that this site has uh, compliant certifications and that they're qualified to basically handle a clinical trial. Uh, and this includes CVs, FDFs, GCPs, medical licenses, the 1572, the investigative brochure, um, the protocol signature pages, and then also lab documents if that's required. Um, also, this includes um, IRB approval, so whether that's local or central. Um, and then also, we're wanting to make sure that we're granting them access to the resources that they're going to need in order to execute the trial. Um, so in the study that I work personally with, it's going to be um, box and smart. So box for like electronic documents. We also send them like uh, the hard documents for like forms and stuff that they would have to fill out. Um, we use a smart sheet for like our pre-screening tracker and then also like the central lab portal, which um, basically our study, we have them uh, take samples from the patient and then they send them off to a central lab, which is located um, somewhere centrally in the country. Um, 
and basically they'll run like the lab tests and then they're able to view them in this portal. Uh, ECD, which is the electronic data capture, and then also like safety portals and stuff like that. So they can get safety letters. Um, again, back to, yeah. So we also send them lab kits and lab supplies so that they can run these clinical trials. Um, it, it obviously depends on what the clinical trial is. Um, for the one I currently work with, we just send them like vials to take blood samples. But for others, it's like um, a vision test or they, um, they give them like uh, cards or something like, like tactile, depending, it, it honestly just depends on what the clinical trial is uh, trying to test for. Um, and then also with the site startup stuff, we um, help review and finalize the site initiation visit report, which is made by the CRA. Um, and basically just make sure that everything is accounted for in that report. This report's like, it's pretty, um, detailed report on just like everything that happened at that visit with the CRA, um, making sure that basically the site is compliant. They were able to like check their machines, see that their calibrations are correct, see that they have proper storage for uh, the drug if that's, um, if the drug has, or if the study has an IP. Um, and then also publishing to ct.gov, which is just a, um, it's a government page where um, clinical trials can be posted publicly. And then if people are looking to try and find treatments to their um, like cancers or ailments, like sicknesses and stuff, they can go on this website and kind of see like, are there any clinical trials in my area that allow, uh, that I could possibly uh, be eligible for. Um, so site management activities, this happens after the site has been initiated. Um, so this is basically where the site's going to be 90% of the time. So the first 5% is going to be their initiation. The last five is going to be when they close out. And the 90% in the middle is when they're um, just like in a management phase of where they're enrolling patients, they're having patients come in for visits, that kind of thing. So I help review um, and finalize the IMV reports, which are just, they're kind of like the SIV reports, but slightly different. Um, just making sure that we're accounting for drug and stuff like that. And that um, the sites um, is meeting, is following the protocol correctly, right? Um, making sure that we have like all of their certificates as well. So collect documents on an ongoing basis, um, help answer questions and assist site staff when needed. A lot of site staff, um, at least in my experience, have had some questions about eligibility um, criteria of whether someone is eligible and they'll usually send us a quick email saying, hey, this patient has this, 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 and this, um, would they still be eligible for the study? They've been on this drug or whatever, um, or, you know, they have diabetes, are they still eligible? And basically going into the protocol, seeing if they are, um, a lot of the times this, um, you know, we have to check off with the medical monitor because they're the ones that at the end of the day are having to make those final decisions. Um, on these patients' eligibility and whether it'd be safe for them to join the clinical trial or not. Um, but we assist in like uh, notifying the medical monitor if it's a super easy question. Um, and in my experience, have like approval to answer it, then then that's that's what I do. Um, tracking IP inventory and destruction. So if a clinical trial has IP, um, you want to make sure that you're accounting for all of it, that none of it's getting lost or, or stolen. I don't, that doesn't really happen, but um, and making sure that it's being destroyed properly. Um, so it's not just like hanging around different areas of the hospital, kind of like making sure that it's being centrally uh, tracked and stuff like that. Um, tracking safety letters. So safety letters are basically when um, there's an adverse event that happens with the drug. Let's say someone takes it and they're getting dizzy and they're throwing up. Um, we want to make sure that other sites and other people know about that, that, you know, we did have a patient that was, you know, getting nauseous and vomiting. Um, and we're not in kind of saying like, this may be caused by the drug. And it goes back to like the medical monitors to kind of determine that. Uh, but just letting the other sites know that this is something that's happened to a previous patient and then they can kind of uh, use their best knowledge to kind of like 
are my patients having this same side effect and stuff like that. So making sure that those are being uh, distributed as well. So all the sites know what's uh, going on. Uh, tracking our pre-screening logs. So um, for the study I'm specifically on, we have a pre-screening log where the sites will put in people that they think might be eligible. And then um, our ops team basically goes in and uh, does a little bit of determination for them. And this kind of just helps with like enrollment and stuff. Um, tracking enrolled patient visits. So when these patients come in to get more drug or to do like tests and stuff like that, we're making sure that um, we're just taking like an active effort and making sure that the site staff that are um, interacting with these patients have the resources they need, that if we are giving them extra drug um, or like we're giving them like new bottles of drug, right? That um, the site has that on hand and they're not, um, you know, so, so that they don't run out basically, right? Um, and then periodically updating sites in study enrollment. Um, this is basically just keeping track and letting all the other sites know like, hey, we have this much enrollment, we're still looking for uh, this many patients. Can you please like look through your databases and see if you have anything um, or any eligible candidates, you know, that you would like to bring in and see if they, uh, want to participate in this clinical trial, right? Um, last thing is, last 5%, right, is site closeout activities. So um, this is going to be helping review and finalize the closeout visit report with the CRA. Um, the, and then also retrieving all documents needed for the closeout visit. So this includes uh, updated financial disclosure forms, uh, the delegation of authority log, IP trackers, and just all the documents that um, uh, that you're going to be filing in the TMF, because after this uh, site closes out and you end your contract with them, they don't really have a responsibility to uh, do any more work for you, right? So you want to make sure that you're retrieving all these documents, because most of the time, these site coordinators, these nurses are super busy, and they're not going to really get around to it. Um, also confirming that all drug has been destroyed or returned. Uh, this also goes for like lab equipment, if we send them like lab equipment. So let's say we let we let them use like an EKG machine. So we bought an EKG machine and we gave it to them to use for the clinical trial. We wanna make sure that um, if the contract states that they, that they have to return it, that we're getting it back. Um, also with drug, you know, let's say that they have three, you know, bottles of, drug left, we want to make sure that they're either returning that to us or they're destroying it properly. We don't want them to have it on hand and then it, you know, co somehow cause uh, someone like an adverse reaction or serious adverse reaction or anything like that. We want to sure that we're uh, accounting for all the drug that's out uh, in the world because we're, we're testing it, right? It's not, it's not, it's safe, but it's not, it might not be, who knows. Um, Confirming uh, all queries and EDC. So this just goes into, so EDC is like, a, it's a bigger thing. It's kind of like uh, what these study coordinators fill out during their site visits with these patients. Um, and a lot of times queries uh, come up with, uh, uh, like when they input like different data and stuff, it'll ask them extra questions and stuff like that. And if those aren't filled, um, it causes a query. Um, and just making sure that those are all kind of like filled out, all the questions uh, in the patient's chart is kind of filled out. Um, confirm all patient samples have been shipped to the central lab or just have been like accounted for in general. We don't want to, you know, close out the site and then figure out, oh, that last patient that we had, um, you know, the week before the closeout, their sample never got tested. We never got the results. You know, you, we, we don't want to be missing data points, right? Um, study kits have been returned. That kind of goes back to like if we gave them an EKG machine or we gave them like uh, like colored cards or something like that, that those are either getting returned to us or they're getting destroyed. Uh, just um, cleaning up in that regard. Um, access revoked to systems. So for us, that would be like our smart sheet, our like electronic uh, document um, center, which is like box. Um, just making sure that we're revoking access so that they don't have that access anymore because they're closed down now. Uh, notifying the IRB, regulatory safety, data management, the SMT in general, that, hey, this site is completely closed out. Um, and also letting the other departments know, like, hey, you should probably get your documents from them. Like, 
some like data management is responsible for making sure that uh, all the queries in EDC are answered. It's also operations responsibility as well, since we direct uh, we interact more directly with the sites, uh, but also letting them know that they can like lock that data, that data center, that site um, data. Um, and then lastly, updating uh, ct.gov, which is again, the like publicly available uh, database where you can see where like, clinical trials are being held and for and what they're doing. Um, lastly, I just kind of put like a miscellaneous, like other responsibilities to help with uh, managing contracts. Um, so this includes like vendors or CROs. Um, like currently we use a vendor for uh, like safety um, we use a vendor for um, sending off uh, paper documents. So we give them like uh, an investigator site file uh, binder, which basically just comes with a bunch of blank forms of like templates that they'll need, that they'll use. So like an IP tracker form um, and stuff like that, or uh, just like various like forms. Um, we use a vendor for that. We basically say, hey, uh, we need to send this site, you know, this binder, can you please make the binder and ship it to them. Um, so that would be like managing contracts, managing a vendor. Um, updating the statement of works as appropriate. So like, you know, if you're running out of money on your vendor contract um, or, you know, you're extending your clinical trial to be longer or you're adding more sites than you initially anticipated, uh, basically helping um, update those contracts so that um, those vendors, those CROs are getting the extra money they need for the expanded uh, clinical trial that you're running. Um, managing site contracts and budgets. So when we onload a site, we initiate a contract with them and we initiate a budget with them, basically saying that like for each step of the clinical trial, you will get this much money. Uh, for each patient you bring in, you'll get this much money. When you close out, you'll get this much money. Uh, and basically just laying that all out there so that everyone kind of knows. Um, managing site payments. So a lot of uh, trial participants will get paid for their activity. Um, and this is, this it's kind of up to the clinical trial team how they want to do that. A lot of the times it's handled internally or externally, it just, they just had to have to have a plan for it. Our study specifically, we use our CRO. So our like CRAs, um, basically that team pays um, the site and the site then gives the money to uh, the patient that's participating. Um, a lot of times it can come straight from the sponsor. So sponsor gives the money to the site, the site gives the money to the patient. Um, but it's just figuring out how, um, your study is specifically going to do that. Um, uploading timelines uh, for upper management. This one's kind of niche that I do, but I think a lot of, um, actually it's not very niche, but um, a lot of studies have like timelines like, oh, when are we going to get uh, the ICFs finalized? When are we going to have our first patient in? When are we going to have our last patient out? When are we thinking this, site, uh, this whole study is going to close? And basically, you know, a lot of upper management people want to see these timelines. They want to know, are we on track to meeting these deadlines or are we needing to extend? What could we do better to help uh, basically stay to these timelines or beat these timelines? Um, so I basically um, will update this, this tracker that we have um, to basically give upper management like a, a feel for where we are in the study um, and if there needs to be like intervention. Um, and then lastly, this one's kind of a catch-all, develop trackers, tools, workflows, and other resources to improve efficacy of ClinOps department actions. So a lot of the times um, we wear a lot of different hats, right? So like, um, you know, your director, your manager says, hey, this process is not very great. Can you just develop a new process? And, you know, you have to be, have like critical thinking and be able to think like, step by step, what am I going to do? What, where is, um, where is things not being super efficient and trying to just like uh, be, uh, build a better system. Uh, and so sometimes I get tasked with stuff like that. Um, 
And I think that's it. Oh, I also put this link. So this is the study that I specifically work on and it's in cta.gov. Oh, cool. Um, and so this study is being conducted to assess safety and tolerability of relative golics, uh, which is an ADT, which is androgen deprivation. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, yeah, or we do see you guys it. Just, yeah. No, we yeah. see it. Androgen deprivation therapy uh, for basically men with prostate cancer with either metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer or non metastatic or metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And so um, if you wanted to see, uh, this goes into the arms. So we have three different parts for the study. Um, and then our outcomes that we're wanting to see, eligibility criteria. So if you were someone that had prostate cancer and you were looking for a clinical trial, you could go through the eligibility criteria and see if you're eligible. And then you could see, oh, well, where, where is it taking place at? And you can look at all of, these are all the different sites. So we have you know a site here at this location and you can kind of, you know, go through like, oh, this one's close to me, you know, or whatever. Like this one's in Dallas. I live in Austin, you know, it's pretty close. So that kind of thing. So I think that is pretty much all I had. Um, definitely open for questions if anyone has any questions. Um, yeah. Well, I'll just kick it off with a big thank you to Nick. I think I think you did a really good job of highlighting the different functions too, like this is what the data management kind of does and how it ties into different things. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Any other questions from the group or anyone want to know, I guess maybe one question for Nick for me that I think people might be, might be helpful is um, what did you like, is there any sort of knowledge or things that you did to help you prepare for the CTA role or things that you think would be beneficial? Um, yeah, so definitely coming out of records management, with records management, it didn't really feel like there was a ton of deadlines. There was also like, there was very big ones, you know, biannual uh, completeness reviews, but there wasn't like a lot of just like deadlines or things that needed to get done. Like you're processing documents and you had like completeness reviews and then, you know, there was like metrics, but like other than that, there wasn't a ton of deadlines. Um, I've noticed with the CTA role, it's a lot more administrative. There's a lot more um, just tinier deadlines that occur and you need to make sure that you're, um, you're tracking those and you're not forgetting about them. Um, and then you're also following up with people if you need for them to like do different things within those, uh, uh, those timelines. So like these IMV reports, right? We're helping in review, finalize IMV reports with CRA. Like we have, you know, 16 sites and you know a CERA will go to one site each month right and so we're getting er, one site every other month every six weeks somewhere in there so we're getting like you know eight IMV reports um, a month nine IMV reports a month and so you know that can build up and these things are you know 12 pages long um, and they all you know have different deadlines you know if we get you know, one, one day and one, two days later, we need to make sure that the one we got first is completed. Um, but we're also having to do both at the same time. Right. And so making sure when I first started, I had sticky notes everywhere. I had notepads with like all my deadlines, um, in my emails, flag things, I would put stuff on my calendar just to make sure that I was keeping track of everything. Right. It's like, you're juggling a lot of balls. And I think trying to transition myself to be more type A, I think helped with that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the, the timeline aspect of the CTA role, because I, I do think that's an advantage um, of the TMF role, is I do feel like a lot of your work, you can almost like, you can do it in the evening, you can kind of do it yeah, at your exactly. own pace. And I think that the CTA, that there might be things you can do proactively, um, and that's something that maybe I'd recommend to Jesse as you transition into a new role is to try to do some things in the evening, like proactively, like look at your trackers and get things ready. But a lot of the work has to be done in the kind of the, the work day, right? Because you're you're following up with people and things like that. And so that is a really good point, Nick. I wasn't thinking of that earlier. And then um, let's see, there is a question. Nick, do you see the question in the chat? Do you want to... Um, um, yeah, I'll see. Hi. Scroll out of the very bottom. <laughs> um, and if not, we can do two. We only have, we have two minutes left. 
Um, I don't know what DLTs are or AESIs are, but an SAE is basically a serious adverse event. Um, yeah, can you speak on what a DLT and an AESI are? Yeah, Keith was supposed to help me just confirm that I got the definitions right, but then there's a spider he found and he's very occupied with a spider. Yeah. Which, um... <laughs> Sorry, it's just, it's just nasty giant black thing with the we... But anyways, we got 22 minutes. Okay, so an AESI is like an adverse event of special interest. Um, and okay. so basically it's like a new AI that's come up with the, the trial drug. The serious adverse event is one that where it leads to like hospitalization. Yeah, or, or death or something like that, yeah. Yeah. But what's a DLT? I'm not quite sure. Hamid, do you know where you saw that? Where the... Hi, guys. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically, it's like a new AI that I just googled yeah, the dose limiting toxicity um yeah so yeah um so usually in i believe it's like phase two studies they like to um basically determine optimal dose um and so they'll run like dose limiting like they'll, they'll do, do like dose escalation tests um okay. um to basically determine where the the most effective point is like on a curve of like if we give them this much dose they're getting 